posterior the temporal muscle. That temporal bone or temporal bone is going to be associated with the ear and hearing. Okay. So if you look again, right, going anterior to posterior in anatomical position, anterior, um, anterior cranial fossa, middle cranial fossa, the posterior cranial fossa itself is mostly actually this occipital bone and that, ox, that um, foramen magnum. But the mountain ridge, I, I call it the mountain ridge, like the little raised elevated part on either side between the middle and posterior cranial fossa going across here. That's the central main part of the temporal bone called the, called the petrous part of the temporal bone. So the petrous temporal. And in life, this has basically everything to do with the ear. It's got the, um, if you trace it out, to the side wall of the skull, it's got that external auditory opening, which we know in life has the tympanic membrane across it. Oops, sorry. No problem. And then, <laughs> and then, of course, on the other side of the tympanic membrane is going to be the middle ear ossicles in that middle ear cavity. And then it's going to press against that inner ear, which is actually in the bone like a space carved out inside the bone. So the whole hearing apparatus from the, the, the tympanic membrane, little middle ear ossicles, and then carved out inside that bone is this elaborate inner ear that has both the cochlea that senses sound vibrations and turns them into a neuronal signal, and also the balance um, um, structures, the semicircular canals, the utricle sac, we see those in lecture. So inside this solid bone, that's where all of that's located. And then the neurons all come together off of the cochlea and also the balance structures, and they emerge on the back of that bone. So I don't know how to get the position right. So I'm looking, that's posterior. This hole on the back of the bone, that's called the internal acoustic meatus. And that's where the neurons come out as a solid nerve now cranial nerve number eight. Remember the three with a V, which is the vestibulocochlear, vestibulocochlear nerve. The vestibular part is the balance part and the cochlear part is the hearing part. So that's all just that petrous part of the temporal bone, that little mountain ridge. We also have the squamous part. And this forms the part of the, the side of the neural cranium. So nothing it's an, it's an easy part, but just to be aware. So when you're looking at the side of the neurocranium, if you follow that, that petrous part out, all of this, that's why the skull isn't great for that. Well, you get the idea. You follow it out right to here, and then you've got the side wall of the skull here, the petrous, the, the um, squamous part of the temporal bone. Here's a temporal bone that's been removed from the skull. So you can see the mountain ridge that would be inside the cranial cavity. This is actually from the, this side, from the, yeah, from the right side, or it's actually the left side. Um, and then there's that squamous. Squamous, remember, means squash. Remember from our tissues. So it's just that flattened part. You also have hanging at the back this process, this bulbous piece sticking off. That's called the mastoid process. This one I like because It really, ori it really orients you to your own skull because you can feel, if you, if you go from your ear like straight down, you can, it's just got skin over it on your own skull and you'll feel that piece kind of, that kind of rounded piece sticking back there. That's the mastoid process. Um, it's probably, um, it's filled with a lot of like air spaces and probably helps to kind of amplify and resonate some of the sound vibrations that are coming into the ear in, in, in mammals that have even better hearing, like a cat, I don't have a, they took away my cat skull, but um, cats have a big bulbous mastoid process with like a big air sac. And the ones that are really impressive are bat skulls, which if you don't know this, bats ha have this incredible sonar. hearing, yeah, sonar, where they can create a visual field, right, by bouncing, echoing sound off of it. So this 
incredibly elaborated hearing. And when you look at the skull, most of it is this mastoid process. That's like a big ball at the back that apparently helps to amplify and, and somehow, um, you know, really resonate with the sounds that are coming in. So that's the mastoid process. And finally, we have what's called the TMJ, which stands for Tempero Mandibular Joint. So this is a joint between the temporal bone and the mandible, or what would you all call it commonly? Jaw, jaw joint, right? Okay. And so that, um, well, you do have the, actually film mine. So there's no lower jaw in here, but he, it's actually right, there's the mastoid process, there's the external auditory opening, and just in front of it is the condyle, the mandibular condyle, where the condyle of the mandible sits, and, and it's, a, it's a condylar joint. It's almost like a hinge joint. The mandible moves up and down, but remember, it's got that side to side, a little front to back, and so that's the, um, it's a condyloid joint. So some of the skulls that have the mandible in place, then you can, there you can see, there's the condyle of the mandible sitting in that rounded mandibular, um, mandibular fossa, where the jaw joint forms between the temporal bone the, um, and, the, and the mandible. The, um, that joint, is um, it's got a meniscus, like the knee joint, a little fibrocartilage pad, and that meniscus tends to be kind of rough, kind of crinkly a little bit. And so it's, it, it's one of, it can be a noisy joint when you, like a lot of people notice sometimes their jaw joint cracks or pops or makes some noise, and you can almost always feel that. Like if you put, you can put your fingers in your ear opening or even just come right in front of it and open and close your jaw and you'll kind of feel that it's not a real smooth action. You'll usually feel it, for most people, it'll kind of go Especially if you kind of just get your fingers right on the mandibular condyle, and you can kind of feel that crinkly action or crinkly nature of that, um, of that uh, meniscus that's in there. Um, how, many people, how many of you know somebody who has TMJ? Yeah, so this is a, it's actually, TMJ syndrome. We all have a TMJ, right? We all have a temporomandibular joint. And I have noticed over the many years that there's this, where that in and out of popularity comes this diagnosis that people get, usually from a dentist, but sometimes from another, like an orthopedist or healthcare provider, that they have TMJ syndrome. They usually just tell them they have TMJ. And the idea is that people might clench their jaws or grind their teeth at night or even during the day, that they build up a lot of tension, that it can then cause headaches, maybe tension into your shoulders. It's not totally clear what the etiology is. That pro like it's, that's why it's a syndrome. Like syndromes are always things that aren't well, that well understood. And it's on the decline. Like five years ago, all my students knew somebody who had TMJ without fail. Now it's like on the decline. We're not hearing so much about it. If I go back like 15 years, it was popular back then. And then it was also popular when I was a kid. Go figure. Um, I'm not saying it's not real. You know, there's people who apparently have a lot of pain.